Coming up on Jerusalem Dateline, Israel celebrates as the Feast of Tabernacles continues. International support on display as people from more than 90 countries show up for the Roll Call of Nations and the Jerusalem March. And an urgent call for intercessors to pray for global stability. Plus, the story of one man's heroism and sacrifice during the Yom Kippur War. All this and more coming up on this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell coming to you from the annual Jerusalem March with thousands of participants both in country and from around the world come to show their support for Israel. Christians are front and center and a few nights ago celebrated Israel at the Roll Call of Nations sponsored by the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem. Paul Strand has that story. Welcome Iran! This gathering, known as the Roll Call of the Nations, recognizes each country's name, and entertainers from all over the world sing and dance. Holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and is to come. Here in Jerusalem at this Roll Call of the Nations, more than 3,000 Christians gathered to celebrate some 90 nations coming here to Israel to worship the Lord their God and to celebrate and support His chosen people. During these special days, the Jewish people remember God taking them from slavery to the Promised Land and welcome others to join the celebration. All the Gentile nations are invited to come up with the Jewish people to Jerusalem to worship the Lord here at Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles. In the Bible, God tells the Israelites that Jerusalem is to be an open city for all who seek Him. It's a house of prayer for all people, so we're welcomed here. It's prophesied about in scriptures like Zechariah 14:16. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. The Lord also made another promise. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the one who promised to bless us when we support Israel. This year, Christians came from the ends of the earth, including down in the South Pacific. We had a whole chartered flight, Fiji Airways, the first time their national airline has landed in Israel with over 250 pilgrims. Heidi Keppa is a chief in the Fiji Islands. With the Lord's blessing, we've been able to have a plane bring us to Israel and going to take us back. And it's the first time, full load. Christians are happy to praise the Lord any old time, but this week in Israel is special because by the very fact of their worshiping God here in the Promised Land, they're fulfilling prophecy written thousands of years ago. Paul Strand, CBN News, reporting from the Roll Call of the Nations in Jerusalem. <laughs> it hasn't all been warmth and friendship here in Jerusalem during the Feast of Tabernacles, as demonstrated by a small toast protest outside the ICEJ's Israeli night. Take a look. About 100 protesters gathered outside the Pais Arena and accused the thousands of Christians who came of being missionaries. But the next day, a video in the old city of Jerusalem went viral. Orthodox men and boys spit on the ground in front of a Christian group carrying a cross on the Via Dolorosa, the traditional place where Jesus went to Calvary to be crucified. The reaction from Israeli and Jewish leaders was immediate. Israeli Prime Minister said there was zero tolerance for this kind of action. The head rabbi of the Western Wall condemned the actions, and CBN News asked Jerusalem Mayor Moshe Leon about his reaction. I condemn it, and we're making sure there won't be any incidents like this in the future. Incidents like this are forbidden in Jerusalem and in the state of Israel. But because I'm the mayor of Jerusalem, I'm responsible to make sure things like this won't happen. At the Jerusalem March, we talked to Israeli media influencer and social media advisor to Prime Minister Netanyahu. He expressed what many Israelis are feeling. All, all corners of the Israeli leadership have condemned it, from the president to the prime minister to uh, members of uh, the Knesset, our parliament. So um, it, it is good to see that Israeli leaders say, take a stand and say, this persecution of Christians does not represent who we are as Israelis. The Jerusalem Post cited one defender of the spitting incident who said on X that perhaps under the influence of Western culture, 
we have forgotten what Christianity is. But I think the millions of Jews who experienced the Crusades, the Inquisition, blood libel, and mass pogroms will never forget. But David Parsons of the ICEJ stated, we must be the first to admit there is a much longer painful history of Christian hostility towards the Jewish people. But thankfully, there has been a sea change in Christian attitudes concerning the nation and people of Israel in our day. Despite the misgivings of a minority, the mood today was joyous. Let's hear from some of the marchers and those who came to watch the march. Sarah, what is it like to be here? It's so much energy, this is unbelievable. And we have such a privilege to bless Israel, and we say we love Israel. The nations are here today because it says in the book of Zechariah, chapter 14, that the nations are going to come and bless the God of Israel and connect to the land of Israel, to Jerusalem, on the Feast of Tabernacles. We call it Sukkot, of course, in the Bible. I'm holding the four species, as it says in the Bible, to do. And the nations are coming uh, to pay homage to the God of Israel, to connect with the people of Israel. And it's a beautiful thing, and I'm here to bless them. They're coming here to bless me, so I'm doing my job and blessing them back. Coming up, leaders from around the world gather in one place to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Another significant event here in Jerusalem this week was a prayer gathering sponsored by Eagle's Wings Ministry. For the past 19 years, on the first Sunday of October, the Day of Prayer for the Peace of Jerusalem has mobilized Christians and Jews around the world to fulfill the command of Psalm 122. Bishop Robert Stearns and the late Pastor Jack Hayford began the Day of Prayer for the Peace of Jerusalem in 2004. Pastor Jack Hayford and I sensed this burden from the Lord to call the global body of Christ to remember the centrality of the story of Jerusalem, its past, its present, and its prophetic future, and that the church needs to be aligned in intercession with God's purposes for Jerusalem. Since its beginning, the day of prayer has expanded worldwide. It has grown now to such a degree, literally all around the world. We have representatives in 172 nations. The material is in 29 languages. There now is a children's curriculum teaching children the importance of Jerusalem, teaching them why it's central to God's story on earth. And just year after year, uh, this year at the event here in Jerusalem, we have close to 50 pastors who've come from 22 nations all over the world to celebrate and pray for the peace of Jerusalem. That includes Pastor Miles McPherson from Rock Church, San Diego. You know, the Bible says to pray for the peace of Israel. May those prosper who love you. Uh, it's a promise that I take serious and more serious now than ever before being here in the country and just God stirring my heart to the reality of his presence and his plan for not only this city, but the world. David Nekrutman sees Jerusalem as a validation of the Bible. Well, this is the absolute certainty that there is a God in the world, not an abstract idea. I think it's harder to be someone like Richard Dawkins, who's an atheist, than to be a believer in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For me to come back after 2,000 years to this country and have Jewish sovereignty again, the only people who ever predicted that were the prophets in our shared scripture. So therefore, by going ahead and connecting to this land, we're saying to the world, God's prophecy is still in fulfillment. Many Israeli leaders see this prayer effort as a blessing to Israel and the Jewish people. It strengthens us a lot where we feel it's not only a thing that we know, it's a thing that we feel, the care, the fraternity of evangelical Christians all over the world with the state of Israel, with the Jewish people, and therefore it contributes a lot to our security, to our sense of security, to our determination to continue to fight for the Jewish people's perseverance. As chairman of the Yad Vashem Holocaust Memorial, Danny Dayan sees the rise of global anti-Semitism. We are not in Germany of the 30s, but the difference between us and the generation of the 1930s is that we have experience. We know it can happen. Therefore, we have to solidify, to strengthen Jerusalem, to strengthen the state of Israel, to strengthen the Jewish people in order to prevent a catastrophe like that that we saw 80 years ago from happening again. This threat is another reason why many say it's a vital time to stand in the gap for Jerusalem. 
There's a lot going on internally in Israel. On the outskirts, there's, Israel is surrounded by uh, neighbors. It's been said they live in a tough neighborhood. The whole world is concentrated on the outcome, what happens in this place. Despite the friction, despite the tension that is feeling in this nation, especially with the judicial reform, threats of terrorism, neighbors want of this place, what the nations want of this place. It is a politically charged place, but it is a place where the Lord says that he has placed his name. Not only are we commanded to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, but we are actually prayer shields. When you take your station at the wall of prayer for Jerusalem, you're taking a, a big responsibility that God has called Christians around the world to do, praying the word of God. Underscoring the need for prayer, we spoke recently with Cindy Jacobs about the urgency of interceding for the nations of the world. Cindy Jacobs, co-founder of Generals of Intercession. Great to be with you back here in Jerusalem. Uh, you've been around the world, and now your sense right now, prophetically, is that we're really in a, in a very critical time that you call 911. Recently, I was in Maui. Uh, some of you may have heard about the fires in Lahaina that burned the, the town. Well, at 3 a.m. in the morning, the Lord awakened me, said, call 911, call 911. And it was so loud. And I realize the Holy Spirit is saying, it's time for the watchman to wake up and arise. We are at, we're in a crucible moment. We are in a moment that, you know, a hinge of history. Either things are gonna go one way or the other for freedom, for the cause of freedom, uh, to save the church from severe persecution. I'm, it's already being persecuted. But uh, we have got to stay on the wall and pray. I, in fact, you know, it's not a time we can just pray our usual prayers. No prayers as usual. We, we can't do that. In fact, here in Jerusalem, today we went to, to the site where they buried Derek Prince, who wrote the book, Shaping History Through Prayer and Fasting. And right now, we need to pray. We need to pray to stop a World War III. We need to pray to see that parts of the world are not overtaken. In fact, uh, when I was coming here to Jerusalem, I was writing down what the Holy Spirit was saying to me, and he said, the map of the world is being redrawn right now. Wow. And, you know, you think about what could happen. South Korea and North Korea. Kim Jong-un just going to Russia. Promises made behind the scenes. Possible promises and things like that and um, threatens China, you know, sending uh, warships near Taiwan. Right. But the good news is intercessors have been going to Taiwan on a regular basis to pray. You know, they're going to Reese Howell's place, who was a great intercessor in England, praying to hold back war. You know, the war clouds looming right now. Mm. It's very serious. I know in that book, uh, Changing History Through Prayer and Fasting, Derek Prince prayed during World War II mm -hmm. and felt like uh, he actually helped pray in General Montgomery, who really led the British forces in El Alamein, mm -hmm. a pivotal battle mm -hmm. that actually saved Jews here in Palestine. Mm -hmm. uh, are you praying for, for those kind of leaders during this time that, mm -hmm. uh, that would be the Lord himself would raise up? Yes, in fact, one of the words I got was something called war president that God wants in 2024 for the U.S. And I said, well, what's a war president? Well, someone who's a very strong president that our enemies are going to think twice before attacking us, before mm -hmm. making a move, because they're so concerned about the level of retribution. Yeah. And so it's critical that we get someone in office that is going to be someone who's very very strong. I know in the Middle East, strength is really paramount. People respect strength and they, they take advantage of weakness. Mm -hmm. And so in, in that regard, you think that's so important that our enemies around the world, wherever they may be, want to be able to be a little hesitant <laughs> to go and be aggressive. That's right. We need Churchills. We need these leaders that will rise up right now. And I believe if we pray, God is going to give them to us. And how can people follow you? Where, where can they get know more about Cindy uh, Jacobs and Generals of Intercession. Well, thank you, generals.org. Okay. And you can reach us, sign up, you know, for our prayer alerts. And I send out SOS alerts and they're very serious and we change history. You also send out words of encouragement, which yeah, is very yes, good. <laughs> yes, we do say a few good things also. That's right. <laughs> Cindy Jacobs, great to be with you here in Jerusalem. Thank you. Up next, one man's courage and quick thinking save the lives of his fellow soldiers 
during the Yom Kippur War. Fifty years ago on October 6th, Arab armies attacked Israel on the holiest day of the Jewish calendar, catching the Jewish state off guard. CBN News Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl brings us an astounding story from that war. On the eve of Yom Kippur in 1973, tensions mounted as the country began its 25-hour fast and planned to spend the day in synagogues praying. Between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, we were here. We received intelligence information from my brigade officer, and he explained to us about the Syrian forces that we were facing. Israeli Defense Minister Moshe Dayan dismissed reports of an imminent Arab coalition attack and convinced Prime Minister Golda Meir not to order a massive reserve call-up. Lieutenant Commander Yitzhak Negreker fought with the 188th Tank Brigade along the Golan Heights border in his area, 15 Israeli tanks faced two Syrian brigades of 600 to 700 tanks. Only 32 Israeli tanks guarded the 55-mile frontier with Syria. We saw the Syrian tanks preparing across the border, bulldozers digging holes and making tank stands. So when we received the information, we were simply scared. That evening, Israeli soldiers slept in their tanks, got up at 5 a.m. and went to the bunker to pray. I'm not a big religious one to pray, but to honor my friends, I also went inside and I prayed together with them. About 10 a.m., I broke down. I couldn't do it anymore because I was very tired. Negreker laid down facing Tel Faris, the largest hill in the area. About 2 p.m., I opened my eyes to everything exploding around me, the murderous artillery of the Syrians. There was black smoke in the air, and I jumped up from the mattress and ran into the bunker, and I yelled to my friends, guys, it's a day of battle. Syrian artillery fire continued until dark, when the tanks began to move in, unwittingly trapping themselves. They couldn't escape. On the right side of the perimeter fences are bulldozers. On the left side, they have the border fence. They can't escape. And just like in the tank practice, we wiped them out one by one from the end to the beginning. Thirty Syrian tanks were burning like torches. They quickly depleted their ammunition, however. Then we received orders to move to Telsaki and arm ourselves with shells from the damaged tank of Brigade 7. Despite heroic attempts to defend this Golan position against a massive Syrian attack, by the morning of the second day, Telsaki was under Syrian control. There, Negreker and more than two dozen soldiers entered a bunker. When we entered, we stepped on the bodies of our friends in the corridor. Menachem Ansbacher sees the morale and takes out a book of psalms. He reads a psalm, and a religious and non-religious guys all answer, Amen. Then he says, guys, we'll get out of here, and we'll all end the war together. Suddenly, a Syrian grenade landed in the bunker, wounding many, including Negreker. Suddenly, I hear Menachem, whoever can go out, go out and tell the Syrians that we are surrendering. Negreker leaves the bunker with his hands raised. Outside, two Syrian soldiers shoot at him, but he manages to evade the bullets. At gunpoint, they ask him how many others are in the bunker. Inside the bunker, I think of my 30 friends. They will face grenades. Therefore, at that moment, I started to think of some logical number, and without blinking an eye, I made a sign of four. Why four? That's a tank crew. Three dead, and I'm the only one alive. Whether they believed me or not, they immediately motioned for me to come down. Only then did Negreker realize he was wounded. In less than three weeks, Israel emerged as victor, though suffered heavy losses. 2,656 Israelis died, more than 7,000 wounded, and 294 became prisoners of war, including Negreker. After eight months in captivity, Negreker returned to Israel. Upon his arrival, he felt responsible for everyone in that bunker, believing them to have been killed, and he expected a firing squad. Instead, after an Israeli interrogation, an officer took him to a waiting taxi. A man asked me, Yitzhak, do you remember me? I tell him, no. Do you remember the guys in Tasaki bunker? So I tell him, yes. But unfortunately, they were all killed, and it's my fault. And then he says, wait, wait, stop. What are you talking about? They're all alive, and you're the one who saved us. And we're waiting for you. Menachem Ansbacher and all the other guys are waiting for you at your house in Yavne. 
Now a husband and father of four sons, Negrecker had pledged during the battle to name his firstborn after his beloved commander, who died during the war. Negrecker and his family later returned to live on the Golan Heights. Julie Stahl, CDN News, Telsaki, Golan Heights. Still ahead, hearing from participants and observers of the Jerusalem March. Before we go, let's talk to a few locals who told us why they love the march. This is a heartwarming, unbelievable, truly heartwarming, and it's just the kids are happy to see how all these people from all around the world, from they're not Jewish, and still come to say we love Israel. It's amazing. We love you. We love the love that you love the Jewish people, and I want to th tell all our Christian friends all around the world. <laughs> Come to Israel, come to Jerusalem, come to Zion. I think it's really beautiful. I think it's amazing when people come together and show joy and love for each other. So this is one of my favorite things of the year. And with all the you know, anti-Semitism that we have to fight and all the hatred and the attacks that are happening both to the Jewish and the Christian community, I think that this is something that is a, as we say in Hebrew, a dugma, an example of what we should live by, saying that we can live in peace and that we can have nations come to the greatest democracy in the Middle East and the greatest outpost of democracy in the world, Israel. I feel it touches many Israelis who come and see this and that there is support out there and that we're not alone. I think it's a beautiful Christian witness to Israel and we need more of it. <laughs> Before we go, we also want to make mention of the passing of a dear friend of Israel, Ray Sanders of the Christian Friends of Israel. Ray had been ill for several years and suffered from Parkinson's. Ray and his wife Sharon founded Christian Friends of Israel, known as CFI, in 1985. For nearly 40 years, Ray faithfully carried out CFI's commitment to comfort and support the people of Israel and informed Christians around the world of God's plan for Israel. He taught the church's responsibility toward the Jewish people and let the Jewish people know many Christians are standing with them. CFI will continue their work under the leadership of Sharon. Well, Ray was a dear friend of Israel and we'll miss him here in Jerusalem. Well, thanks for joining us on this special edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Please join us on social media. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.